from Microbe TV. This is Public Health with Lori Garrett, recorded on September 22nd, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today from New York, Lori Garrett. Welcome. Hi, Vincent. Good to see you again. Uh, Lori was, was last on... TWIV number 773, and we had a wonderful wide-ranging conversation about your career and your thoughts about public health, and I recommend listeners go to check that out. Laurie, 773, we are now on 940 <laughs> episodes, so we're really moving quickly. And we hope that this uh, is the first in a series of discussions about public health, which is uh, Lori's specialty. In particular today, we're going to talk about wastewater testing and um, what what that means and what, what it can be used for. But before we do that, I want to uh, remind everyone that if you're uh, interested in celebrating the molecule of the year, the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, and support science education, you can purchase a spike t-shirt from vaccinated.us. All the profits from their sales during September go to supporting our work here at Microbe TV. So go over to vaccinated.us, pick your T-shirt. It's got a picture of the spike protein on the front. <laughs> put it put it in your cart and then use the promo code Microbe TV on checkout and the uh, proceeds will come to us. And we really appreciate their support of uh, our science programming here. And thanks to Matt for coming up with this idea. Okay, Lori, uh, everyone seems to know about wastewater testing these days, but it, what's the history of it, at least in the U.S.? Yeah, well, all forms of sort of environmental testing for the presence of microbes, the possibility of an epidemic, or just general surveillance um, have been kind of stuck in a rut for decades and it was basically coliform testing, a very, very simple method of grabbing a water sample from a stream or an outflow of some sort and pouring it over a filter and then culturing that filter to see if E. coli or other bacteria grew on that filter, identifying the bacteria and saying, oh my goodness, there's a bunch of E. coli here. And it's similar to what might be done on the other end, which is testing the water supply going into the system, as well as what's coming out of the system as an indicator of what kind of infection there might be in human beings uh, upstream, if you will. Uh, it's relatively recent that viruses are in the mix, but it was still a small number of viral types. It was the major contributors to dysentery, so noroviruses, for example. And uh, some places were testing for hepatitis A, and some, in very rare cases, fortunately, were testing for polio because it was from wastewater that London first realized they had a polio outbreak or at least people were shedding polio into the sewage system. Um, and then before that, all the way back to 2013, Israel identified in wastewater samples wild-type polio, and then in 2021 identified vaccine-derived polio in wastewater samples. In both cases, they were early warning systems before human cases were seen. So, uh, there is a history that goes a long ways back, but it was really very much focused on dysentery producing bacteria. Uh, and now you flash forward and finally the, you know, the great technological breakthroughs that allowed us to sequence the human genome and then go the many steps from there to routine use of PCR to identify all sorts of genetic phenomena in our environment and inside of us, and for that matter, to conduct um, diagnostic tests for COVID that our average viewer would be very familiar with. Uh, these sorts of assays have dramatically changed the game. It's now possible to not only look at for viruses, but to look for specific mutant sequences so that you're, you're actually looking for, say, 
antibiotic resistance genes in the case of bacteria, or perhaps um, antibody resistant genetic changes that are allowing COVID to ev evade the immune system. You're looking for markers that say there's new types of COVID out there, or in some cases, there's monkeypox out there. There's whatever out there, fill in the blank. Um, and all of this is possible because not only is genetic sequencing defying Moore's law and becoming cheaper and faster at a rate that far exceeds Moore's prediction of innovation in computer science, but it is getting to the point where you can make, you can sequence an entire human genome for about a hundred dollars now with a new analysis done by a group in Berkeley. And, um, you can identify uh, genetic markers in liquid samples, whether it's blood or water or wastewater or whatever it is you're looking for, um, using devices that are about the size of my thumb and that plug in to a USB port. So now you're going to the step where you're talking about your telephone is your primary sequencer, if you will. You're, you're able to analyze genetic data from your environment uh, on site in real time and upload the information to a cloud to share with whomever. Um, this could be nothing less than the greatest revolutionary change in public health since Jon Snow. I mean, it could not only dramatically change how we approach the notion of advance warning, early warning, risk assessment, um, to know what is in our environment and who in our community might be carrying something. But it, You know, my, my uh, colleague Dixon de Pommier likes to say that the sewer and the toilet was the greatest invention of humanity because it took the pathogens away from the streets, right? And now we can use that to trace what people are shedding, right? Because of the technology that we now have, if you, as you've said. But it doesn't have to stop at wastewater. I mean, you know, when you think about how crudely we currently assess the safety of our food supply, it's, it's ridiculous. We randomly select something less than 1% of food samples that are sold in markets around the United States. Um, at times, it's way below 1%, depending on fiscal vagaries in the United States. And then they're kind of mashed up crudely, and we look for the classic list of bacteria and some fungi. Uh, and in rare cases, we sample for pesticide residues. That's it. So there could be all kinds of things in food, and we're not even applying um, 1990s technology to the effort in most cases, much less 21st century. Well, for food, uh, we wait for an outbreak, right? And then we go and figure it out. And then we go out. hunting. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. We go hunting, and we try to culture in the lab. So those are techniques that go back, you know, 1970s, <laughs> even earlier. Sure. Um, and the other possibility that I'd love for us to talk about regarding the use of wastewater, if we want to focus there, and our new <clears throat> genomic ap approaches to screening, is that it can democratize to a tremendous degree who has access to this capacity and this information and change the game. We are, we're at a time when health departments across America and frankly all over the world are beleaguered. They've lost personnel under COVID. They've been robbing Peter to pay Paul to, to do all their various components of pandemic control for COVID and now polio and monkeypox here in the US. Um, by stealing money from other programs, less money for syphilis, less money for mammograms, less money for uh, child education and vaccination and so on. And the personnel are burning out. So we need an approach to going into the 21st century and into climate change era when our environment is rapidly changing right before our eyes. We need an approach that brings a bigger army into the game and an army that doesn't have to have PhDs, 
doesn't even need a master's in public health or biology that can use um, technology that is now ever cheaper, ever easier, ever more portable uh, in order to do the sampling, which then can be analyzed by the more um, advanced, trained, and educated individuals. So are you, are you suggesting that people could sample their own wastewater? Or well, it's already it... happening. Frankly, mm -hmm. if, you know, if you look at uh, what's, what's gone from the, the wristwatch to monitor your heart rate and your, how many steps did you take and all that sort of thing, you're already seeing people going the next step and saying, well, can I find out what my microbiome is like? Is it a healthy microbiome? Can I find out what's in my drinking water? Um, and all the technology is coming way down in price. I, I would predict that we're going to, within the next five to 10 years, depending on the recession and the economy, we will be at a point where um, average citizens, uh, companies for their own employees, safety, school districts, all sorts of, of groups and entities that we don't think of as traditional public health will be sampling the, uh, their environment in various ways to determine what constitutes an early warning system to tell them we have a pandemic, we have a new disease, we have something going on, some of our employees are carrying X, Y, or Z. And I think COVID has just revolutionized it all. Everybody's realizing, well, let me, let me take a step aside and ask you this. You know, one of our problems with everything to do with viruses is that people are scared of them. And scary means behavioral problems. It means overreaction or underreaction, denial or freak out. It means um, all sorts of tensions with government and with authority figures, including scientists. And it's, it makes life hell. If you, if you confine your analysis of threat to individual perception of threat, individual testing, you're going to always go up against those realities, those issues. But if you can screen an environment, screen a community, everybody's anonymous, nobody's name is attached, but we suddenly see a signal, a cryptic form of COVID that is not Omicron, it's a whole new clade and it's out there and somebody or some many people are already carrying it and passing it in their feces into the uh, environment, then I think you you really shift the ball game. Don't you agree? Yeah, I think it's like, so right now we can do, people can do their own testing, right? They can get a rapid antigen test and they get a, a, a band, right? But people don't know what it means. It means you've got virus in you, but you don't know how much, you don't know how much you're shedding, you know how dangerous you are. So, if you could get more information, that would be useful. And that's what you're basically talking about. Because if you're doing sequencing, you're going to get more specific information. So I agree. I think that, the you know, early in this uh, pandemic, the idea came that if we could have a, do a $1 test where you could test your saliva and get within a minute, whether you're positive or not, that could be a game changer before vaccines, right? then you could decide whether you're going to work or going to school or not. You could do multiple testings. And we never got that um, in time, but maybe what you're talking about could be some kind of substitute as long as it's cheaper, right? Well, let's look at the polio example because that's really your area of expertise. The We now know that um, the city of New York and the state of New York are very actively screening wastewater all over the state looking for polio ever since the first case was identified in Rockland County. Um, and we, we can now say, yeah, there's somebody shedding polio in that ends up in the wastewater in three or four counties in uh, the state of New York, fortunately not yet in New York city, I don't believe. Um, and we can also say, what kind of polio is it? Is it wild type polio as is circulating in Pakistan and Afghanistan? Or is it uh, vaccine derived polio? And if it is vaccine derived polio, what does that say about 
what we need to do as a matter of policy and public health. Don't, wouldn't you consider this a, you know, a, a triumph? Oh, absolutely. But, you know, we should have been doing this for many years, as you know, right? When we switched from OPV to IPV in 2000, we should have started looking in wastewater because that would tell us whether those OPV strains were still circulating, whether they're introduced from other countries, whether they persist, whether there are bursts of uh, finding the virus. We don't have any of that data, which is essential. We're just starting now. So it's, it's better now than never. But uh, it's always disturbed me that we waited uh, so long to look for that. But you're absolutely right. And, and this should not just be done in New York City. It should be done throughout the country. Where is poliovirus in the U.S.? I bet it's in many places, but we just haven't known it. Uh, and uh, I, I think it needs to get better. Now, your, your su suggestion for people to do it is certainly great. I just worry uh, that people won't know what to do and they may try and game the system, right? Some people will... Uh, right? So my <laughs> suggestion is not... And, the, and, and you're absolutely right. My suggestion is not that the average person become their own personal uh, public health department. Okay. On the contrary, I, I would still want data to go into a conduit of central centralized assessment and follow-up. Yeah. You know, if somebody finds something, this is the tragedy right now of the home antigen test. Somebody can find out they're infected, but it never gets recorded as data right. in our national system. Right. There's no follow-up analysis unless they become sick enough that they're hospitalized. And then there's follow-up and more details. Unfortunately, right. because of vaccination, fewer and fewer Americans are getting hospitalized. Uh, but we don't really have good data to tell us how many are infected right. and how many may have a mild case that may or may not end up being a long COVID case down the road. We are in a giant data gap. So I'm not advocating making that worse. I think just uh, the opposite. Look, let's take... Let's take, for example, polio, imagining that we had successfully eradicated. So, you know, as most of our audience knows, billions of dollars have been spent mm -hmm. by the UN system, by Bill Gates, by Rotary Club, a variety of entities to try and completely eradicate polio from planet Earth, much as we did smallpox, you know, decades ago. And so... It's really narrowed down to two key countries. Um, although we get sporadic cases of both wild type and vaccine derived polio popping up here and there, which tells us that we're going to need to have, even after we declare, yes, we've eradicated, we're going to have to have environmental monitoring for decades to come. We won't be able to just simply roll over and say, yay, another one vanquished. Let's, let's put that in the history books. Um, Right now, there's really no money put towards that. No one's really imagining what that would look like and how that would be done. And the army, if you will, of polio fighters in the world is mostly um, poorly edu educated or even illiterate and mostly women who risk their lives going up against the Taliban and other uh, forces that are opposed to vaccination, uh, to go out into the hinterlands vaccinating. Um, and since they're using the oral vaccine, you know, it's just a drop. It's an easy procedure for someone with minimally educated to effectively edu uh, vaccinate multiple children in a village at once. Well, we need a tech that that same individual can now simultaneously maybe do some vaccinating or whatever public health intervention, but also collect water samples and take a quick look and see, has polio returned to this village? And if so, which type of polio is it? And then focus efforts on getting back to that village, doing revaccination campaign and bringing that polio to a halt. And you know, the newest technologies make that um, seriously doable, cheap, and it can involve if the right software and the right attention is put to the already existent technology, it can involve something that is so simple that 
all they need is a phone and a little device, and they pop the little device into the phone, and the phone will give them a simple yes, no. There is or isn't polio in this sample. So they don't need to understand anything. They don't have to know what RNA is and that polio is an RNA virus. They don't have to know any of this. All they have to know is the sample came up, yes or no. So in that, in a sense, what we're talking about is creating litmus test. Well, if you can test for a tiny little polio, you can also test for cholera. You can also test for all sorts of microorganisms. And I think it's a waste of resources to limit ourselves. We should be thinking about what are the key categories of pathogens that form a risk to humanity on one level or another, and creating a sort of universal screening device that can be used primarily on wastewater, but also in, in animal systems so that we have a one health approach. We're asking, where's the animal waste from livestock? Where's the effluent that can tell us what's going on with wildlife? Key rivers, key streams, key lakes that we might look at that would tell us wow, H5N1 has made a comeback as a very dangerous influenza showing up in this duck population in, that happens to be nesting on this lake. Should we not take that back to the lab now? Let's, let's really scrutinize that genome. Let's figure out if it's got the capacity to infect human cells. And if it does, let's get a move on. So the... Um one of the problems I foresee is that, you know, here in the U.S. and many other countries, we have a wastewater system that takes sewage from homes and puts it into a central place. And that's easy to sample. But not every country has that, right? So how do you sample wastewater in a small village where it just runs off somewhere? Well, first of all, most urban environments, even sort of peri-urban, relatively small communities, have a form of wastewater distribution, whether it's formal and, you know, safe or whether it's that's the river and it dumps into the lake over there or it dumps into the ocean over here. But there usually is a particular output point mm -hmm. or multiple okay. ones that you can target. At the village level, in my experience, there tends to be some sort of an outhouse kind of situation, a latrine, if you will, either multiple or if it's a very, very small village, one or two, and those could be sampled. Okay. That's a I little see. funkier operation. Sure. <clears throat> it requires a little more um, willpower on the part of the sampler, um, but it can be done. All right. So obviously people who are doing the sampling have to be instructed how to, to do this, right? How to do it. Now, the other part of this equation is the device that you've been talking about, which doesn't exist, right, but needs to be made. And is that possible? It is certainly possible. The problem is that right now, the economic sort of incentives for the industry of all the companies that make things like the Oxford Nanopore Manion or the Illumina now smaller device that can do a screen for $18 – um, and a long list of companies are in this space, uh, but the pressures on them are very different. The market that they are looking at are things like rapid identification of genes that make uh, an individual in the wealthy world have a predilection towards a certain type of cancer or um, identification of, of uh, chemotherapy-resistant genes in cancer cells. Um, in other words, there are things that are about individualized medical care at a tertiary level. Um, now, COVID has created a mass purchasing phenomenon, which hopefully is moving the technology. But to get the technology where it really needs to go, you know, it needs to be something about, about the size of a ballpoint pen with the sampler at the tip. And you can dip it like a dipstick, like a litmus test, a dipstick. And then all the, the amplification PCR steps are contained inside that pen. And at the other end of the pen is your USB input or whatever type to go into your phone. If not your phone, your laptop. 
Um, so you have an all in one, and then all of this, the price point has to be about a dollar. And if you want it to put to mass use in developing countries, it's got to come down to about a nickel, but you could have 70, you know, 95 cents subsidized by the, the equivalent of the Gates Foundation and a nickel paid by the country per sampling. Now you're getting someplace where you could have an early warning system um, that combines sampling for human carriage of pathogens and the one health concern. So you're looking for spillover events or potential spillover so that this goes into veterinary use and livestock use. Imagine if uh, chicken producers in Bangladesh were routinely sampling for a range of influenza viruses in their chickens and could affordably do it, uh, you know, uploading to their home laptop or their phone. And if they find something, it's going straight to their livestock control office, whatever it may be, their Department of Agriculture. And you have then the powers of far greater and more sophisticated technology swoop in and do the necessary analyses to determine, is this dangerous? Do we need to, you know, kill off a lot of chickens? So the device is going to be basically pathogen agnostic, right? doesn't matter what you're looking for. It can figure it out. Well, ideally, it should also be class identifying. So, for example, if you see a phylovirus, you don't need to know it's Ebola in particular. Or that it's, you know, you just need to know phyloviruses be very, very bad. Let us move quickly and identify this. If you see any Nipah class virus, you're going to jump. I mean, this, is, this depends on people in those areas where you would find phyloviruses and Nipah and Hendra's actually doing some surveillance, right? That's the key is to get really high penetration, right? And that's why when I say citizen engagement, I'm not talking about personalized medicine. I'm yeah. talking about, uh, well, I'll give you an example. I spent some time in Bangladesh and one of, the, one of my journeys involved a very long trek to a village where there had been a Nipah virus outbreak that had just ended a few days before or been declared ended. Um, and in order to get to this village, uh, I had to take a vehicle for some distance and then a bicycle f across a series of dikes, um, zigzagging through Bangladesh for many miles. Uh, so this isn't an accessible space. And it's so densely populated that one couldn't fly a helicopter and find a safe landing spot. Um, once at the village, it was obvious what the phenomenon was, it was the palm trees and the, the way they would capture the palm nectar, the juice or sap, and the fight between the bats and the children over who got that delicious sweet sap. And if the bats got to it first, they passed the virus in their saliva and their urine uh, while um, sipping sap, the sap, and the sap then became contaminated. So when the children went up the tree, they pulled it out. Well, <clears throat> there's no way that uh, currently health department officials can make it to all those little villages and to those remote locations to do some kind of current level testing, which involves drawing lots of samples and then getting all the way back to the lab and hoping your samples remain intact for this long journey back to a laboratory and then processing for days in the lab, by which time it's likely the kids already got the disease and now they're in the hospital. Um, but if places that had had experience with NEPA uh, could have identified community leaders or an identified individual who makes a small part-time income as a public health liaison, a community health worker, and they're empowered with a tool that allows them to dip into samples that the kids collect off the trees and see if there's Nipah virus in them, now you're getting somewhere. So is such a device uh, possible and can someone make it? 
I think it is possible, and I think someone could make it. I just think the incentives aren't in place. Okay. And, you know, this goes back to what we're dealing with right now with COVID and access to vaccines. It's that the vaccine we needed from the very beginning was an oral vaccine or a nasal vaccine. We didn't need an IM vaccine that required needles. We didn't need a vaccine that required deep, 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 deep freezing. And we didn't need a vaccine at a price point that was just completely out of touch for 90% of the world population. Um, now we have no equity and access to the available vaccines. And so we have a massive population of the planet that's either never vaccinated or under vaccinated, never boosted. Um, this, this is the problem. We haven't got the, the faces every innovation in public health. The buyer has no money. The buyer, you know, you talk about tuberculosis. It's inexcusable that in the 21st century, tuberculosis is still a major killer. But who gets TB? It's not usually you and I and our friends and people we know and people who live around us. It's poor people and people in terrible housing, people in, uh, that are often malnourished and live in communities where the community norm is poor housing and poor nutrition. And in that environment, they can be exposed to the bacteria that causes uh, tuberculosis. And, it, you know, it's been very hard to get drug companies engaged, to get the innovations of modern science put to coming up with better and better ways of both testing for and treating and hopefully a better vaccine someday for tuberculosis because, you know, it's not a good buying pool. So the problem with something like this is here we have the technology. I mean, goodness, uh, Rob Knight and uh, Jack Gilbert out at uh, UC San Diego have figured out how to screen wastewater in the San Diego County area for the presence of what are called cryptic strains of uh, COVID, forms of the virus, SARS-CoV-2, that are may not actually be in circulation widely. May, they may literally be finding a genetic signal that's only in one human being, or frankly, could be in a rat, could be in a dog, right. could be in a pigeon for all we know. Um, but it's a strain that's genetically markedly different from the common circulating form. So they literally are at an early warning system capacity to be able to say, San Diego County, it's no longer Omicron. We see whatever the next Greek letter is going to be, you know, Rho or Psi or whatever. And, Don't forget uh, Pi. Don't forget Pi. Pi. <laughs> I think they, they might skip that because um, everybody would be thinking of a Pi. Um, <laughs> and, and I think it's, you know, if that capacity exists, if we're already at that, then there's really no reason why we can't be at, targeting a much more broadly applicable, affordable approach. You know, now I know your compatriots on the virology side will say, well, there's imprecision. And, you know, a little device like that is going to be sloppy. Uh, you know, it's going to have an error rate. Um, and a lot of it's going to depend on, you know, what oligonucleotides are put into the system and so on and so forth. And I would say back, yeah, it's sloppy. So is a litmus test. So are all the things that we do out there. The coliform test is slappy. It's a cheap, slappy test. But you know what? It protects millions of people. And slappy is the way you do frontline public health. The precision comes when the warning system is ringing. And now you sure. come in yep. with your ultra-precise tools. So this is not meant to replace national wastewater surveillance systems, no, right? No, 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 no. We need to expand national. Here in the United States, we're only up to about a thousand sites. And it's heavily oriented towards the logical states, you know, that have very strong public health systems. Um, so a lot of those sites are in New York and California, for example. Yeah. Um, what we need is to get to a point where we're we're really doing surveillance routinely across 
every single major outflow in America. And frankly, it, it would do us well to be doing surveillance at this kind of level of the Great Lakes and of some of the biggest river systems and broaden our look for possible spillover events. So these thousand sites, are they state level, you know, State Department of Health sites run locally basically, or are there is there a national Some, some of them are city, but they're working, at, they're officially accredited as CDC sites and therefore they're feeding their data to the CDC. But this is another part of the system problem that um, that we can't uh, dodge and we can't understate. And that is that our public health system is broke. When you get down to the local level, it is so underfunded. I mean, people are still using fax machines. People, Many sites are still, many public health departments have no epidemiologist at all. So there's no disease detective on staff whatsoever. Many public health departments um, are still using forms of Windows uh, software that can't even, you know, handle Adobe transfer. So you can't even send a, a large JPEG or PDF somewhere. I mean, we are, we're dealing with a level of poverty in the system that is both financial and personnel. So there, the departments that have already latched on to the wastewater surveillance are also the ones that are better equipped and better have better, higher skills level of their personnel and reasonable laboratory capacity. But as we demand a, a proliferation, we're going to need easier technology and we're going to need to link directly to cloud. We can't imagine that a small rural health department in a county with a population density of, you know, something really, really low is going to be able to have its own laboratory capacity and its own ability to analyze, you know, the genomic data. So this argues even more for what I'm talking about, something where it's all contained and it goes straight into a cloud and there's some other level that's doing the analysis where you have talent concentrated. And that may be in in the case of New York, it may be our, our Wadsworth Laboratory, our state's pr premier infectious disease laboratory. Nationally, it would logically be the CDC. Um, and some states may find that they're, they're going to send directly to the CDC because the, nowhere in the state does the capacity exist. So can you explain to me how these departments of health work? So if you have a state that you don't need to have a local department of health everywhere, right? There should be central ones, as you're saying, Wadsworth Center for New York State. And any local offices could just give their, their specimens to them. Is that how it works? Well, <laughs> <laughs> we have a problem in the United States that's uniquely American, and that is that our public health system arose as a local phenomenon and eventually became national. Everywhere else in the world, it started national and trickled down. So we don't have a uniform set of regulations. We don't have a uniform set of standards of public health. Um, this becomes most acute, as we have seen with COVID, when um, the lack of uniform standards affects human behavior requirements. So one state may say you must be vaccinated, and the next state says you're on your own, do whatever the heck you want. Um, but it also is true when you get down to the laboratory level. Now, the CDC has tried for decades to standardize uh, most aspects of lab work that are related to pathogens. Uh, and the FDA on its side has tried to standardize for certain kinds of food screening. And USDA has tried to standardize for certain kinds of veterinary and livestock screening. But the truth is, it's highly variable from not just state to state, but county to county, locality to locality. Um, and we don't really have a way of imposing a national standard that says everybody has to do this kind of test. We, the, the one exception to what I'm talking about would be things like 
the EPA sets standards for pesticide res- residue. And if the EPA says nothing above this can be sold across state lines, that usually is enough to force every state, regardless of the political interests and economic interests within the state, to adopt or aspire to screening for that level of contamination because they want to be able to export their agricultural products to neighbor states and make money. But the pathogen picture is much more complicated and, it, and the level, the standards become more complicated. I think the most sobering moment for public health on all of this, when everybody went, uh-oh, hubris, 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 was the anthrax mailings of 2001. Because it turned out all the standards of both um, how you tested for anthrax uh, and how you assigned risk to anthrax. How many spores did it take? to cause anthrax disease. What was the difference between spores you touched and then put to your mouth and spores you inhaled and all this stuff? And it turned out all of it was based on uh, 1960s and 50s military tests back when we had a biological warfare program before Nixon shut it all down in 1972. And um, it was all, you know, completely bogus and wrong. So public health was scrambling to figure out how do you find anthrax and how many spores is too many spores and how do you kill those spores and what do you do with them and so on and how dangerous is it? And it turned out everything that was thought to be absolutely written stone was wrong. And I think it forced, uh, I mean, I remember at one point walking into the, the New York City Public Health Laboratory uh, which had only, I believe, three scientists trying to process all alleged anthrax samples coming into New York. And remember, we really did have anthrax samples. We had more than any other area of the world uh, because so many letters were sent to news organizations, to the networks and so on. Um, And all of the three, I believe two of them got anthrax in the process of trying to sample and and test. And the whole lab got contaminated because the police were just marching right in with gazillions of samples and dumping them on the floor. And it was everything from like lawn chairs that had white mysterious powder on them. Uh, whole entire sofas were brought in. And then of course, letters and micro samples. And it turned out that nobody really knew what the heck they were doing. And if it was bad in New York City, which had, uh, I think everybody would agree, the most sophisticated public health lab outside of CDC in the country, then you could just imagine what was going on all around the Washington, D.C. area, the Philadelphia area, in Connecticut, where we still have no idea how Otilly Lundgren got infected and why she died of anthrax. There's absolutely no clue what really happened with her. And so I think that sobered everybody up, that this notion of environmental surveillance for a, a, a pathogenic organism, even something huge like an anthrax spore, would, be, would require better technology and a more sophisticated sense of how a public health department should operate. So are we better off now than we were then in terms well, of technology? <laughs> I think, yeah, I mean, we didn't have PCR to use at scale than we do now. Um, But do we know more about what does it take to treat anthrax and what does it take to cause the disease itself? Um, Actually, I think we have more mysteries than answers. Yeah, well, I I think part of the problem is there's not a lot of disease to study, right? So can't get that well, information. It's, it's not ethical to induce disease yeah, right. and to deliberately expose people. Yeah. So the, um, the, I guess part of the problem is that every state wants to be independent and CDC can't tell them what to do. They can only make recommendations, right? Right. They can only make recommendations. And as you know, uh, the CDC has come under a lot of attack for how yeah. it has responded to COVID. 
And Rochelle Walensky, the director of the CDC, has ordered a kind of uh, top to bottom review that is meant to result in reforms. And I've, of course, seen these executed with every major epidemic the United States has been through in my lifetime. And the CDC always takes the blame and the CDC always undergoes a reform process. And it usually leaves them in low morale and an exodus of a fair number of scientists. And and then you're back to square one all over again. And uh, it's hard to know where this goes. But what Walensky has tried repeatedly to tell Congress in testimony over the last several months is there's a limit to what the CDC can do if the if everything rests on locally acquired data and the local capacity to acquire data is limited. And that's true whether you're asking how many people have been hospitalized and were they or were they not vaccinated. It turns out we have no clue for the United States. We're making it up because there's most of the states are not processing that data. If they are, it, there's holes in it. Um, all kinds of key data points are missing and the follow-up is very poor. Um, and the lag time in delivering data is incredible. It can run from a matter of hours in some states to weeks in other states. So the individuals you're trying to track are long since lost to follow up. Either they died or they've just gone home and disappeared from the system and there wasn't adequate information about them to be able to track them down. And I think with monkeypox, what we're seeing is evidence of what happens when what you're really looking at is transmission that is likely occurring between anonymous partners. They don't know each other's names. They're meeting via online dating apps. And uh, this is true in the gay community, but it's also true in the straight community, whether you're using Grindr or Tinder or whatever it is. There, there is a tremendous difficulty in following up and doing the hard gumshoe work to figure out how transmission is happening and to slow that transmission down. Um, and I think wastewater has already proven very helpful in at least saying, all right, we have a problem in this county or in this city. There's monkeypox in the wastewater. That means we've got transmission. And, you know, one of the Vincent, one of the exciting things is some groups have even come up with ways to extrapolate from specific samples uh, measured against the size of the local population, et cetera, to determine what level of human infection is occurring already so that they can, from wastewater samples, say, uh, we think this is just a handful of cases or say, wow, we have an outbreak. There's probably more than 100 cases out there or even worse. We could actually do a whole episode on CDC, but let me just ask you one question. Is there a country with a CDC where it's done properly? Well, what is proper? Um, it is easier to do uh, all that CDC is trying to do if you are if you have a centralized top-down health system, if you have a national health system so that everybody is really in the system, is captured, there's a singular database. Um, if you don't have competing public and private flows of capital for health, which means then competing uh, databases and reason for certain participants in the health system to not provide data at all. Uh, particularly data that might reflect poorly on them, such as whether or not they have hospital-borne transmission, right? Um, so, yeah, there's places where it's easier to do public health, such as, uh, say, France, for example, or Canada. But if you look at them and ask, well, has that resulted in them having a markedly lower uh, rate of disease, well, let's take the example of the UK and its national health system. Actually, the UK has been the harbinger 
for us every time of a new variant emerging uh, that's about to sweep over us. And they've had massive hospitalization rates for COVID and massive uh, death rates and um, huge catastrophic failures in their system. So I don't know that we can point and say, this is the right way to do it. And COVID has shown strategic plans are all but absent in most of the world. Very few countries have even attempted to take a national strategic approach to their epidemic. The marked exception, of course, is China. So back to wastewater, can we expect now in the coming months and years that, at least in the U.S., we're going to not just look for SARS-CoV-2, because I assume we're going to be looking for that forever, right? <laughs> um, but oh, also right. poliovirus, monkeypox, influenza, rotavirus, norovirus, why not everything, right? Well, that's what I'm saying. It should be everything. And it has to be beyond, I mean, the problem with wastewater is, again, that you don't know if the contribution, if you will, came from a human or an animal. Sure, sure. Um, And so there has to be a way of doing follow-up and screening from sites that are able to tell you, oh, it's in rats, it's in whatever animal. Um, so there has to be a way of going at this uh, with a veterinary input and a livestock input and a wildlife input, if you want to call rats in the, our subway wildlife. Uh, and I think, you know, we can get there. We can do this. But there has to be commitment. Well, that's, that's the problem that I'm hearing, right? That uh, the CDC cannot make it happen. So where do you get this commitment from? And, you know, it's always wrapped up with Congress because they provide the funding, right? I think if uh, it's interesting, WHO has been convening meetings about um, genomic science mm-hmm. and recently put out a very strong statement about equity in genomic science. Uh, and with the concern about national sovereignty and who owns and controls our genes, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because mm-hmm. our, can outsiders uh, take genomic data from inside our country uh, and what can they do with it? Um, but it is clear that um, an institution like the World Health Organization or an institution like UNICEF, could have a huge impact on this. If UNICEF were to announce, uh, you know, tomorrow that all of their vaccination programs would now be coupled with on-the-ground surveillance for the microbes against which they are vaccinating, so that they're doing measles and rubella and pertussis and polio in all its forms and hepatitis and HPV. And you go down the list of all the things for which we currently vaccinate children. Um, you could have a dramatic input impact on the market. That, I mean, that would automatically bring a, a huge amount of the industry into that space. It's about creating the financial incentive that um, results in industry saying, oh, you're right, this is this is a good profit area. Let's get in here. Uh, I, I found that New York State, by the way, does wastewater testing for other things, opioids, antimicrobial resistant bacteria, influenza, respiratory syncytial virus, hepatitis A, hepatitis E, polio, and of course, SARS-CoV-2. Um, and monkeypox. So, and monkeypox. It- it's, which is great. And I think, you know, all states should be doing this. Yes. Uh, and look at that range. It's everything from humongous bacteria yeah. all the way down to individual chemicals. So, it, you know, we're not looking at limitation that says, oh, we can only, you know, scan for DNA viruses right. or some such thing. Sure. I mean, the coliform yeah. assay, <clears throat> you know, has limited us for decades to looking for pretty darn big bacteria. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's clear that if you look for things, you will get advance notice when things are going to happen. It's very obvious. And, you know, when you have to catch up, it's very hard, right? That's right. Well, and another example is, 
if you're looking at a river sample, for example, uh, uh, let us say it's New Orleans and you want to know what's in uh, not just the treated wastewater, but also effluent that's flowing um, illegally or what have you into out from the Mississippi into the Gulf of Mexico. And we know a lot is because microbiome tests are showing huge fluctuations in key microbiome population distributions that reflect, you know, what they have to eat, if you will, what's coming downstream towards them. Well, if you're New Orleans, it would help a lot if your neighbors upstream, meaning up the Mississippi all the way to St. Paul, Minnesota, we're also doing sampling so that you know, oh, we're just getting what came from, uh, you know, uh, Iowa down, down the Mississippi and they need to deal with it because uh, we're being put at risk. And that of course then means, oh, you do need something like the CDC to referee all this between the states. Another example might be, um, you do have areas of the country where the outflow from um, wastewater treatment plants is shared perhaps in, in ocean space between two states. Uh, again, they need cooperation to do the epidemiology and the tracking to figure out what is their source. I'm always thinking about, you know, the story of E. coli 0157, sometimes referred to as the -the jack-in-the-box disease, (laughs) because it was first spotted in a -a jack-in-the-box in Seattle. And it was spotted in Seattle because they have a darn good public health system and a very vigilant surveillance capacity, but it didn't come from the state of Washington. It didn't originate there. It came from cattle country in uh, uh, Idaho, I believe. And years later, there was an outbreak of the E. coli 0157 um, uh, hemolytic uremia disease in children in Japan. And it became so serious that they were closing schools they traced it to the school lunches that were provided on site at the, I believe it was the Tokyo uh, prefect. And as they did more testing, it was in the daikon, you know, that those um, horseradish sprouts that are yep. so yep. popular in Japanese cuisine. Well, it turned out the daikon did not, it was grown in Japan, but it was grown from seed that came from Idaho. And it turned out, the plant where the, the sort of industrial farm that made the daikon seed was downstream from a big cattle ranch. And so the E. coli 0157 came from the cattle, was passed in waste, their waste into the river, went downstream. That river water was used to irrigate the daikon uh, fields and the daikon seed actually concentrated E. coli inside the seed so that when they grew plants from it in greenhouses in Japan, the plants already had the mutant form of E. coli inside the plants. And it grew with the stems of the plants. And of course, they ate, they, they eat the sprouts raw, uncooked. So there was no step in that process all the way from the cows to the school children in Tokyo where uh, the, the bacteria would have been killed. Now the question was, are there steps where it could have been screened for? You bet. Sure. And it would have yeah. been that stream in Idaho. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, the multiple steps where you could have sampled and even the seeds, right? You could have sampled and said, oh, there's this batch has uh, 105. Let's get rid of it. Yeah. Um, so I hope that COVID has made it clear that this kind of environmental sampling is extremely valuable. And I hope we, uh, we end up doing more of it. Uh, otherwise, we're we're wasting uh, a missed opportunity. I think we're miss, we're missing the opportunity to, to potentially bring to public health the most important new tool it has acquired since the dawn of vaccination. Hmm. It That's could it. completely change the game. Yeah, risk assessment would go from 
such crude things as screening, using artificial intelligence to screen the internet for purchase of aspirin and uh, complaints of headaches. Right. Right. To say, oh, gee, this population has more headaches than usual. Maybe there's something circulating there. I mean, that's the kind of thing we do right now. Sure. But the precision of screening for genomic signals is just so much better. Yeah, agreed. All <coughs> so right. We are at an hour. We should keep these to an hour. Anything we miss that needs to be mentioned, Lori? We cover. Uh, the only thing I would say is apologies for anything that I've said over broad. <laughs> and some company, no doubt, will notify us and say, but we do this. <laughs> um, but I, I think uh, we need to have the power of big think right now, imaginative thinking. We have to go beyond um, this sort of narrow focus on my lab can do this and my lab can do that and expand out to how could we completely change the way we play this game of risk assessment and rapid response? How can we make it affordable, easy to execute by average individuals, and precise enough that with a more sophisticated secondary investigation and response, we can protect humanity and our animals from key diseases. All right, that is uh, Public Health with Lori Garrett. You can find her at lauriegarrett.com. Thank you, Lori, for chatting with me today. Thank you. Always great to talk to you. I'm Vincent Racaniello. We'll see you next time.